My name is Ty Swinkleblack. I'm an Iowa City Foreign Relations Council board member and today's host uh, for the program. The Iowa City Foreign Relations Council hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. And we thank our members, volunteers, and our interns for making these forums possible since the year that former UI student and airliner patron Tom Brokaw was named NBC Nightly News Anchor, which was in 1983. I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, which is a growing list in light of the fact that we've been doing extra fundraising in preparation for moving our offices. Uh, so thank you to the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, as well as today's special sponsors, Mike Margolin, John Menninger, Alan Swanson from Blank and McCune Realtors, uh, and Alice and Ken Atkinson. I also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2 and the UI Library's digital archives. Our over 220 Iowa City Foreign Relations Council podcasts can now be found on iTunes. It's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Andrea Cohen, who will introduce herself and today's speakers. Andrea. Good afternoon. I know, tough crowd. I'm going to have to do my best. My name is Andrea Cohen, and I serve as a member of the University of Iowa Center for Human Rights Advisory Board. I'm also the past executive director of the Iowa United Nations Association. It's my pleasure to introduce two outstanding undergraduate students engaged with the University of Iowa Center for Human Rights and who are producing significant scholarship on pressing human rights concerns, which, as you all know, um, is the topic of discussion for all of us at the moment. Both students serve as Rex Honey interns at UICHR and undertake on-campus programming and educational outreach. This summer, the University Center for Human Rights will provide funding to support work by UI students in human rights organizations around the world through the Kenneth Camille Internship Program. The program is named to honor the late director of the University Center for Human Rights, Kenneth J. Camille, who was a professor and faculty member in the UI Department of History and an internationally renowned scholar of the history of human rights. The program established in 2005 was the fulfillment of a long-standing vision for Professor Camille. As Amy Weissman, Assistant Director at the Center for Human Rights has stated, Ken's vision to make the center a unique and valuable resource for student learning about human rights, his generous and effective leadership, and his commitment to human rights work in all its forms brought this program to life and remains its guiding force. This program is made possible through support of community members like yourself who contribute financially to the Center for Human Rights and enable student learning about human rights. If you'd like to support a student, please let me know or let Amy Weissman know, um, and I can relay that information to her. Sarah Hassan is a UI pre-law senior majoring in English with a human rights certificate. She's a resident of Iowa City and will be speaking on the history and current political violence occurring on the streets on, of her native country, Sudan. Caitlin Chenu is a senior at the University of Iowa and a Rex Honey intern. She pursued a research project on asylum policy in France this past summer with support from international programs and the Stanley family. She will be graduating in May and going on to attend Yolo y I'll try that. Loyola University Chicago Law School. She plans to study international and comparative law with a focus on Im immigration. Please join me in welcoming Caitlin and Sarah. Hurriya salamu adala. Athora khiyar al-shab. Freedom, peace, and justice. 
Revolution is the choice of the people. This is a chant that has been echoing across Sudan since 19 December 2018. Today I am here to give a sense of what the anger on the streets of Sudan is stemming from. Today I am here for the Sudanese population who has been calling for revolution, who has been calling for the downfall of President Omar al-Bashir and his government, who has been ruling the country for 30 repressive years. When we talk about the Sudanese revolution, we are talking about an accumulation of three decades of anger at the institutional corruption, the suppression, the senseless killings, the injustice, and the flagrant violations of human rights. President Omar al-Bashir came into power by leading a military coup in 1989. Today, I will evince the atrocities that have took place under his regime. 21 April 1990, Dr. Ali Fadol was a professor at the University of Khartoum. He identified himself with a political group that opposed Bashir and his government. He was thus arrested from his own home, taken into a ghost house, where he faced the ugliest ways of torture. Dr. Ali Fadol had had a nail hammered into his head until he died. Under Bashir's regime, there are thousands of professors, activists, journalists, writers, who have voiced the slightest criticism against the government. that are subjected to torture on a daily basis in ghost houses and underground prisons. Article 152 in the Memorandum to the 1991 Penal Code states, whoever does in public an indecent act or an act contrary to public morals, or wears an obscene outfit, or contrary to public morals, or causing an annoyance to public feelings, shall be punished with flogging, which may not exceed 40 lashes, or with fine, or with both. This is a law that has been established to disproportionately police and terrorize women. Police officers in Sudan get too much leeway with enforcing this law. The law is not based on a concrete, objective definition of what an obscene outfit is. There has been numerous instances in Sudan where a police officer has decided on his own terms that a woman's outfit is too revealing, have had women arrested, beaten, and publicly humiliated. Since the beginning of the protests in November, the people of Sudan have been chanting, Sawt al Mar'a Thawra, the voice of the women is revolution women have been at the forefront of this revolution. It is a stand against oppression, violence, and the violation of women's rights in Sudan. Omar al-Bashir is wanted by the International Criminal Court under 10 counts of crimes. Five counts of crimes against humanity, two counts of war crimes, and three counts of genocide, all committed between 2003 and 2008 in Darfur, Sudan. The Sudanese Liberation Movement and the Justice and Equality Movement were Sudanese opposition groups in Darfur who became outspoken about the government's discrimination against the non-Arab tribes, the Fur, the Masalit, and Zagawa. The government responded by carrying out an ethnic cleansing, killing more than 500,000 civilians and ordering the rape of innocent women and children. A prevalent chant in today's protest is, Ya Ansari Magrur, Kull al Balad Darfur. You arrogant racist, the whole country is Darfur. The Sudanese revolution is a stand against the oppression of tribalism and Arabization. Since 2012, the people of the Nuba Mountains in South Kordofan have been bombarded by a bloody counterinsurgency campaign launched by the government who said they want to, get, they want to rid the mountains of further rebels. Their Antonov planes bombed the Nuba indiscriminately until 2017. The bombing has caused 225,000 people from Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile to flee to refugee camps in South Sudan and Ethiopia. And those pictures are from a video of children from the Nuba Mountains who were reciting a poem about them being orphaned as a result of the bombings. And as you can see, some of them are shown with missing body parts as a result of the bombings. Their signs read, the next Sudan makes everybody equal. 
the other sign reads, down with Bashir and his regime for a free, democratic, secular Sudan, for a Sudan that makes place for everybody. Since, since 19 December 2018, over 80 people have lost their lives for simply protesting peacefully. The use of live ammunition and tear gas has become a daily occurrence in order to break up demonstrations. Three civilians have suffered permanent loss of body parts as a result of security forces firing tear gas at them. Abu Bakr al-Fadlabi lost three fingers on his right hand. Muhammad al-Masri lost his right hand. Amani Abdel Fattah lost her eye. Twenty-four December 2018, Shawqi al-Sadiq was a 12-year-old boy who took part in the demonstrations. The government has appointed snipers on top of buildings to shoot at peaceful protesters. Shawqi al-Sadiq had had a bullet to his head from a sniper on top of the building. He later became a symbol of the Sudanese uprising, and he has been drawn in many revolutionary art pieces. February 2nd, 2019, Ahmed Al Khair, a Sudanese teacher, was arrested from his own house in Kassala, East Sudan. He was taken by security forces into prison, and he was raped with a sharp object that was said to be over half a meter in length. Ahmed Al Khair was raped and tortured to death. 26 February 2019, Two young boys, Mu'ayyad Yasir, aged five, and his brother Muhammad Yasir, aged six, were sleeping in their own house. An armored military pickup truck broke their house down and ran over the two little boys. Muhammad Yasir is in a critical condition. Mu'ayyad Yasir lost his life. And so in Sudan, you die. You die because you come from a non-Arab tribe in an African country that is ruled by an Arab supremacist. You die in a refugee camp. You die because you are a woman that is too brave and too loud in a country made for men. You die because you speak up. You die because you demand your most fundamental human rights. You die from heartache. And unless the system is pulled out from its roots, you die even in your sleep. 6 April 2019. The people of Sudan have organized a demonstration named Millionia, a millions people march. People have gathered in front of Sudan's armed forces and held a sit-in. The population of the capital of Sudan, Khartoum, is over 5 million. An estimated amount of over 3,500,000 people took part in this demonstration. They stayed overnight, and in fact, they are still in the same spot here as I speak, a sit-in that has lasted 12 days till now. 11 April 2019. Seven days ago, it was announced that there will be a statement from Sudan's armed forces, which is the building that they have been gathering in front of for days now. The wait lasted eight hours since they announced that there will shortly be a statement from them. And so we all waited with anticipation, anxiety, and eagerness. It was revealed that Omar al-Bashir has been removed from power after 30 years. It was the first day of my life where Omar al-Bashir was not president. And yet, my happiness could not be complete. Omar al-Bashir was to be replaced with a military transitional government led by Awad ibn Auf for two years. Awad ibn Auf was al-Bashir's vice president. And he was also the main policymaker and the main creator of the Jinjaweed militia who are responsible for the war crimes in Darfur, making him just like al-Bashir, wanted by the International Criminal Court. In other words, the government has replaced corruption with corruption. The military transitional government is another face for Omar al-Bashir. After appointing Awad ibn Auf the head of the military transitional government, the protests only got fiercer. The people refused to accept a leader that does not fulfill the prospects for freedom, peace, and justice. They chanted, the revolution has just begun. 12 April 2019, the next day, Awad ibn Auf resigns from his position as head of military transitional government 
after ruling for only 23 hours and 40 minutes. This makes Sudan the only country in the world that is taking down two heads of state in less than 48 hours. Now, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan is the new head of military transitional government. The people of Sudan still refuse to leave the sit-in. The revolution is far from over. Omar al-Bashir has fallen, but his regime has not. The revolution continues until a full transition of power is given to a civilian transitional body. The revolution continues until every lost life is avenged. The revolution continues until Omar al-Bashir and his governmental officials are prosecuted for the atrocities that they have committed. The people of Sudan will not accept anything less than a revolution, anything less than justice. Hope is an intangible currency. We now have hope, and it's palpable in the air. Anxiety and fear loom just around the corner. But for now, hope reigns supreme. And if you've ever walked around Sudan, you would know it's been missing for decades. This is for a pain that starts fires and for a love that builds a house from ash. Thank you. All right, hi, I'm Kate. Just make sure. Okay, um, thanks ICFRC for letting me share today something I'm really passionate about. Um, and my advisor, Amy, who couldn't be here today, but I like to thank her as well. Um, and then the Stanley UI Foundation, just because you've made this possible and I was able to do this research last summer. My last thank you goes to the Trump administration for giving myself in the future and other immigration lawyers plenty to do as we work to <laughs> dismantle the rising fear and detrimental immigration policies that the current administration is putting in place. So my goal today is to talk a little bit about why asylum seekers in France are suffering and perceptions of migrants are largely very negative, and then to tie it back to the United States and relate a little bit to the asylum situation we're facing here. Um, asylum seekers in France are suffering both socially and economically due to a legal structure in place that blocks them from obtaining work during the first six months their asylum applications are being processed. Um, so I just want to quickly and broadly um, define the differences between asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, in France, it's different in every country. So in France, there are two kinds of asylum protection. The first is refugee status and entails applying for asylum, gaining refugee status after. The second type is called subsidiary protection. Basically, if you don't qualify for refugee status in France, you can potentially gain subsidiary protection if you are determined to be in danger of suffering either execution, torture, or if you're a civilian, um, if you're in the middle of an internal or in international armed conflict, if you're in danger of losing your life because of that. So those are kind of the grounds separate from being a refugee. Under certain conditions, you can also bring your immediate family with you if you get subsidiary protection, but not always. Subsidiary protection lasts one year and is renewable, and both individuals with this protection and refugee status get many of the same social benefits as French citizens, such as free health care and public education, which we don't really get here as citizens, so I think it's a good deal for that. Um, <laughs> Once a person has applied for asylum and obtained the refugee status in France, they're eligible to live and work in the country, bring their immediate family to France, and notably they have the right to apply immediately to begin the naturalization process to become a French citizen. So in order to gain this status, the individual has to be fall into one of the five protected classes under the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees. So those are... Um, race, religion, political opinion, nationality, or membership of a particular social class, which can be interpreted very widely depending on where you are and who you're working with. Um, they have to prove that they fall into one of these categories, which as an asylum seeker is pretty difficult to do. You don't usually bring a lot of documents when you come fleeing from your country. A lot of times asylum seekers are fleeing from their country, like their government. The government does not want to supply documents proving that they're trying to kill the people. So it's, it's a hard situation in any country. 
So if the application takes longer than six months to be reviewed, the asylum seeker may apply for a temporary work permit. And if they can get that, then they're able to work conditionally. But to obtain the work permit, they first have to prove that someone has offered them a job, which most of the time employers don't want to do if they're asylum seekers because it's just very complicated. Um, so if you gain refugee status in France, you can, you'll get a residence permit that's valid for 10 years. If you are granted subsidy protection, you'll receive one as well, but again, it's only for a year. It's kind of like the green card in the United States. Um, you have to apply and receive the renewal of the residence permit within three months of the expiration date. Refugees in France, I have found personally, are typically the best off once they receive their status. They have a lot more benefits and protections than those either waiting for asylum or having have the subsidy protection. So because of this, I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on those who are not legally recognized as refugees. This is kind of my, these are the options. They're not great, but they're there. Um, so this research kind of began when I received a Stanley Award for International Research last year, and I went to France last summer to interview refugees and asylum seekers, as well as French nationals. Initially, I wanted to learn on how to better the policies governing refugee aid and welfare programs. However, after I conducted the interviews, with asylum seekers and refugees, I realized the latter were the ones who needed change, or sorry, refugees and asylum seekers. The refugees were a lot better off, so the asylum seekers were the ones who really needed policy change. Interviews with migrants were conducted primarily at a school for young adult asylum seekers in Paris called Pierre Clavé. Um, and then the, also they were conducted at another association of refugee journalists called Maison de Journalistes. Most of the asylees interviewed had been in the country for at least a year. Due to institutional review board regulations, I was not able to interview the most vulnerable populations of migrants, um, and I'll point that out in the next slide. The refugees and asylum seekers were diverse in age, origin, physical appearance, and level of education, which caused their experiences as migrants in France to vary greatly, um, and I had a lot of diverse responses to most of the questions asked. Um, an overwhelming majority, though, and French nationals asserted that the policy on asylum seekers must change in order for attitudes towards migrants to shift and allow them to contribute more to French society. The French nationals interviewed also indicated that if asylum seekers were able to work, they would see many of these issues resolved very quickly. The, frustra the frustration stemming from a lot of the French that I talked to is that they think that asylees don't want to work when it's actually quite the opposite, but they don't talk to them. Skin color was a significant factor in how a person was treated during their time in France, but typically it was coupled with country of origin and level of education as well. The first interviewee that I talked to was my taxi driver from the airport. He was from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and he gave a narrative on his treatment that highlighted the racism of many French. He was mistreated in police custody. He was kidnapped, beaten, and imprisoned without reason. He said that France was not a good country for refugees or asylum seekers, and that he had expected better from a developed Western country. One prominent issue with this racism is that it comes from government officials. This man was discriminated upon the basis of the color of his skin by police and by the court system. However, country of origin played a significant role as well. A journalist I interviewed from Raqqa, Syria, spoke about this. He talked about being treated with suspicion and how people seemed more guarded when he mentioned that he was from Raqqa specifically, which was from 2014 to 2017, was the de facto capital of ISIS. Um, for him, he said he added oftentimes that he was a journalist and that kind of helped, but he said that he felt a wall form as soon as they found out where he was from. One final and major issue brought up during interviews was the word refugee. So having refugee status means that you have a lot of financial and social benefits in France. However, based off interviews who had this status, the word is often accompanied by negative changes in how they're treated by French people. 
A young woman I spoke with from Armenia discussed this, saying, quote, when people see your refugee card, they don't know what to think. In France, it's not that people don't like you, but there is a distance because they don't understand you. If, you know, if they know you as a refugee first, a wall forms. A similar experience was felt by a 19-year-old boy from Damascus, Syria, whose mother had refugee status. He said that when it came to respecting refugees as human beings, the French do not do this, especially from people who work in refugee services, which is an issue. Refugees are treated well in terms of being allowed to have their basic economic needs met within the French system, but not when it comes to social acceptance or integration. Asylum seekers, however, are even worse off because they face the same social stigmas and lack of acceptance than those with refugee status, but on top of this, they're blocked from being able to take care of themselves economically. The inability of asylum seekers to apply for a work permit during the first six months their asylum application is being processed is one of the largest reasons cited during these interviews um, that there are issues between migrants and the French. It puts more pressure on the welfare system. It creates a divide between people because of a lack of understanding. And the French continue to believe that migrants are choosing not to work and choosing to live off of their taxes. And the asylum seekers are angered by not being able to find work or support themselves or their families. Um, this is, so this is uh, at least the first that one, that's under Porte la Chapelle. It's north of Paris, but it's still in the city. Um, this is where a lot of migrants go when they're awaiting asylum because there's just nowhere to, else to go, especially in Paris, which is pretty overcrowded. Um, but you can see it's next to really nice buildings. Um, these, this was this summer, so I, in the winter it still happens, just not as much. Um, so just to give you kind of an idea, so Porte de la Chapelle is like pretty close to like Montmartre, which is a huge popular like tourist destination. I put the house there. That's where I did a lot of my work. It was um, in the middle of embassies, very nice. Obviously there's a lot of tourist attractions around there, um, but it wasn't that far from where people were living in tents. And then this is the worst picture. Okay, so I only took one picture the whole time doing actual work, and it was on the day that it rained. <laughs> so, but I have to, you know, whatever. So this is the door to Pierre Clavé. Um, it is in the middle of, it's just the door and a wall. You go in, and it's like a courtyard. There's a little restaurant, and then there's the school. So that's where I spent a lot of my summer. Um, we were just outside there talking. Um, so I obviously was interviewing people who were pretty vulnerable and most of the time fleeing from someone or countries. So pictures weren't really something they loved. So this man, he offered, he told me I could take his picture. He's an actor. He's really sweet. Um, he's from Afghanistan. So we were just having an interview. Again, it's a terrible picture, but just kind of show. Um, and then I've been working on this. It's not perfect, but this is kind of my cycle. I've identified a lot of issues. And it's kind of just, they're unable to work, support themselves. The French look at them, what do you see? People not working, negative attitudes, and then more welfare goes to support them. But they really just wanna be able to work. And the welfare doesn't really do that much. So that's a work in progress. So the six months asylees have to wait until they can find work is new. Until September 10th, 2018, asylum seekers had to wait nine months before they could look for work. Keep in mind the research conducted this summer was concluded a couple of months before this law went into effect. Um, so people were still talking about the nine month regulation. So this law was initially revealed on February 21st in 2018 by President Emmanuel Macron and seen as an extremely controversial immigration bill that would affect thousands of migrants in France. The details of the bill include imposing fines and jail time on illegal border crossings, faster asylum processing times that double the amount of times asylum seekers are held in detention, as well as accelerating time to process asylum requests. So the interior minister, Gérard Colomb, stated that the proposed changes were the most restrictive in 70 years on immigration. However, well, let's get into the good stuff after. The other bad thing is that you have 120 days to file for asylum in France. They cut that in half, which means that the most vulnerable populations 
who don't know how to seek asylum go through that process have less time, has ha have half as much time to file for asylum. That will cut down on the number of people actually being able to find asylum and they'll just get sent back. Um, so the good change I identified is that it changed the number of months you have to wait after filing for, filing for asylum to work from nine to six months. This cuts down on the number of asylum seekers being unable to support themselves, as well as the amount of welfare the French have to allocate to asylum seekers, which in turn will hopefully lead to less tension between French nationals and migrants in France. It's pretty new, so we don't really know yet, but hopefully in the future we will. This change in the law leads one to believe that France does want and need asylum seekers working in the country, and it helps to refute arguments against those who do not want asylum seekers working and taking jobs, which is not just a French thing. So why does this matter to the United States? Much of the world looks to America, not always as a shining example of humanity, but still they look at us. In France and within the European Union, people pay attention to how we treat migrants and asylees. I arrived in France in June of 2018. Guess what was happening in the US? Guess what was being broadcast on every single major news channel besides the World Cup? This, Can everyone read that? Okay, France may have migration issues, but in their view, we are separating children from their parents at the US-Mexico border. So people in France looked at me and asked why I was trying to solve immigration issues there when there were clearly more in the US. They don't do that there. So something else I wanna talk about is the criminalization of asylum seekers, which we've been doing here, they've started doing there because they look at us and they say, well, let's try it. Like I mentioned earlier, the law passed in September by President Macron does a great job of casting asylum seekers in a far more negative light than before. However, this is not unique to France, again. As of this Tuesday, United States Attorney General William Barr announced that asylum seekers should be held indefinitely without bond while they await hearings. These are people who have already proven that they have a credible fear of returning back to their country of origin. Barr was really sweet and said this only applied to people who did not arrive through legal ports of entry. But here's the thing. No matter where they enter the US, asylum seekers have not actually done anything illegal when they arrive with the intent to file for asylum within one year of arriving. So the idea of putting them in detention centers, AKA prisons, is a huge violation of their fundamental human rights. Barr is pushing Trump's narrative that asylees are criminals and should be treated as such. But wait, I wanna look at something else, okay? This is the quick and easy guide on how to get asylum in the United States. It's the Citizen and Immigration Services page, so it's official, I checked. Let's take a closer look at the introduction. I don't know if you can read this, I zoomed in really high, and also I drew really weird lines, so please excuse that. But I hope Attorney General Barr knows about this. It says that you may apply for asylum status regardless of how you arrive in the United States. Right there. That means regardless of where you entered the US, you are legally allowed to apply for asylum. You are not in the US illegally until you have been here for over one year without filing for asylum. Thank you, that's all I have. I'm going to read one that was uh, certainly at the top of my mind for you, Sarah, if you want to join me at the podium, um, which is just asking, you know, and I know you don't have a crystal ball, uh, but what you think will happen next in Sudan. And if is there a structure that you think is is in place so that a civilian government can take over? Yeah. Um, so I believe that People have reached a point of no return. Um, people are very hopeful and people are constantly looking towards the future and putting plans towards a better, a just government because it has been a government that has been there for three decades. And so we're still trying to figure our way out of that. Um, but, and I should also mention that the people who organize the protests are called the Sudanese Professional Association. And they are basically the 
doctors, the engineers, the pharmacists in Sudan, but nobody knows their identity because that would obviously uh, put them in danger. Um, and they anonymously, they would just post things on Twitter, like on this day, we will gather in front of this and three million people show up to that place. So, and um, also access to social media has been blocked in Sudan, but people are still um, out of sheer resourcefulness are um, working with VPN with um, like programs that allow them to access that information. And they're documenting their own revolution by posting the videos and the pictures. And so I think I'm very hopeful about it, about that because everyone believes in a better tomorrow. Everyone believes in a better Sudan. And I think, I, I believe we're going to come out better. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kate, the next question's for you. Um, uh, wondering whether or not people who ha are, f are either asylum seekers or refugees from former French colonies, uh, do they fare any better? Is there a different process? Uh, are they received or perceived differently than, um, than the general population? Or is, is it just really truly informed on sort of today's current political environment? Um, so I have only, I mean, again, the man from the DRC I spoke with clearly did not have a great experience. Um, I think it doesn't really matter because the French, for, I mean, I'm not speaking for all French, but it, I don't think it's, we're not like, oh, we feel bad because we did this. It's not as much as like in the U.S., people are still talking about slavery and they're still saying we are like, this is something that will never go away. That's not the same for people in France who have had former colonies. They don't feel, I mean, again, not all French, but the majority that I've spoken with and as a French person, it's not like a thing you're feeling sorry for and you have to make up for. So no, I don't think that they're treated differently um, in regards to their country of origin. And before you walk away, um, I'll have you stay right here and ask you um, a uh, two-part question D did you did your research uh, and discussion uh, help uh, you understand you know kind of what the percentage of those who uh, obtain refugee status are whether they're able to find work or what percentage of them are able to find work and and sort of linked to that is if somebody's coming in and they are able to find work, sooner um, or an opportunity, then does that help them speed up the process or navigate the process? Um, so again, the majority of people that I interviewed were people who came in as either professionals having a higher level of education than the majority. Um, they weren't the refugees, the asylum seekers coming in and living under bridges because I was not, like, I had a ton of regulations on who I could and couldn't interview. So I think it's a little skewed that way. And from my interviews, people coming in and getting refugee status that I spoke with had no problems getting work once they had that status. But again, the majority of them had been to the, a university or spoke really, you know, great French or great English, one of them. So I'm not sure. Honestly, I think probably the majority of people seeking asylum are not in that category, but, you know. And then the second part of the question, I don't, so the, the deadlines for, you know, you're awaiting your asylum and you're, you have to wait six months, that isn't able to be sped up at all. You might get, once you hit that deadline, you have to like go through the process of obtaining a work permit. That part might be sped up if you have that job offer, but the the deadline, the minimum time you have to wait will not be. Um, Sarah, can you comment on uh, what your thoughts are about how the United States and other uh, governments react to uh, what's happening in the Sudan? and just the people's revolution there. So I believe in the majority of Sudanese people believe that the international body could have done more to um, raise awareness on what's going on in Sudan right now. And 
So the way the revolution started is um, something that fueled the revolution was the financial crisis in Sudan. There was an inflation rate of over 139%. And um, people were, day-to-day -day life was becoming very difficult and people could not get their basic needs met every single day. And that's what sparked it. And then they were like, and the revolution grew into something bigger and bigger and then grew into uh, wanting to remove the entire system that has been infringing on the people. And so I remember like a month into the revolution when I would watch the news, it would still say, oh, a month, a month uh, of protests for Sudan's rising bread prices. And like completely neglecting all everything else that has been happening. It's not about bread, it's more about the rights of the people and the atrocities that have took place. But I feel like I think nobody covered the situation better than the people of Sudan themselves and the people, although they did have restrictions to social media, they did have restrictions in so many different ways, but I believe they, they were the ones who actually got the word out. Yeah. Um, and uh, hosts uh, prerogative, I uh, wanted to just ask you each, since I um, don't have any additional questions from the audience, if you could give us a little bit of uh, a summary, I guess, or your thoughts about sort of how you've um, chosen your academic path since you both um, have decided, uh, you know, your pre-law and your uh, on your way to Loyola. Uh, give us an idea of kind of your your personal or academic experience and how that informs uh, your academic career. Um, so I've been interested in immigration since probably high school. Um, I'm actually, I was born in France. My dad's here, he's French. If you hear him talk, you can tell. My mom is a court interpreter. <laughs> My mom's a court interpreter um, as a French interpreter. So I've been interested in international migration for a while. Um, I came in to Iowa not really knowing what I wanted to do with that. And then I took a first year class with Amy Wiseman who many of you know um, about law, and I became really interested in immigration law. So, But I've also been interested in international public law for a very long time. So I think the human rights program here really focuses on um, international law a lot, which I love. So that's why I'm going to Loyola this fall. Hopefully I'll do OK. But yeah, that's why I'm here. Um, for me personally, I think I'm becoming more aware of my voice in the diaspora and realizing that how in my comfort, in the comfort of diaspora, that it, it's becoming a great responsibility for me to speak up for the sake of people in my country who would get a bullet in the head for doing the things that I'm doing right now. And so I just really realized the strength that law, the, the strong role that law plays in international affairs. And it's something that I would love to contribute to. Well, thank you both. Um, we now conclude our program, and I uh, just want to send out a shout out to both of our speakers today, uh, Sarah Hassan and Caitlin Shenu. And um, thank you, and especially Sarah, who um, you know popped in at the very last minute to to um, help replace uh, change in our speakers. So uh, we really appreciated hearing from both of you today. I also want to thank our, our sponsors, University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, um, the uh, Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, as well as our t today's special uh, financial supporters, Mike Margolin, John Menninger, Alan Swanson from Blank and McCune Realtors, and Allison Ken Atkinson. And again, our warm thanks to City Channel 4 uh, for making our programs really good and available uh, to our viewing audiences. Uh, Caitlin and Sarah, as a small token of our appreciation, uh, we'd like to present you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. You'll, you'll need a lot of coffee to make it through law school, so. Um, 
And uh, with that, our uh, program today is concluded. So thanks, and we'll see you next week, we hope. Bye-bye.